Thank you, Dr. Zhao. We need to begin by thanking this year's annual meeting planning committee, and particularly the incredible NAM staff who worked with us. It's a tribute to them that for the first time in history, the scientific program could not only be shifted to a virtual platform, but accomplished on a greatly compressed timeframe. Today's sessions are centered on two topics of enormous importance to our country and our planet. COVID-19 and climate change. I'm very grateful to all of the annual meeting planning committee members whose names are listed on the NAM annual meeting webpage. Special thanks to Lynn Goldman and Dick Jackson for their help in organizing today's climate change session and Carlos Del Rio and Nikki Lurie for their work on the COVID-19 session. One year ago, the world looked very different than it does today. A global public health catastrophe, the COVID-19 pandemic is reshaping our society. And now more than ever, those of us in the scientific community find ourselves at an inflection point, one where all of us here today and the public we serve are facing unprecedented challenges from the personal tragedies of loss of life to economic hardships not seen in America for nearly a century. Yet throughout history, we have seen that meaningful change nearly always occurs in times of crisis. So the two topics chosen for today, the COVID-19 pandemic and the climate change and climate change are both crises and both require our boldest thinking and our decisive action. Our format for the scientific program today will be comprised of two panels, one for each topic with a break in between and the day will then conclude with the president's panel. Um, we will begin each panel with a keynote lecture, followed by a moderated discussion with an expert panel, and then 20 minutes for audience Q&A. We encourage you to ask questions utilizing the Q&A tool available under the live stream. Our first session is entitled, The State of the COVID-19 Pandemic, Virus Emergence, the the impact of the pandemic and US and global preparedness and response. It's my honor to introduce our keynote speaker, venerated physician and immunologist, Dr. Anthony Fauci, who will speak on COVID-19 public health and scientific challenges. Dr. Fauci has served as director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, NIAID, at the NIH since 1984 where through enduring and skillful leadership, he has profoundly infect, impacted research and treatment of infectious and immune mediated diseases in the US and worldwide. In addition, as the longtime chief of the NIAID Laboratory of Immunoregulation, he's made many seminal contributions in basic and clinical research and is one of the world's most cited biomedical scientists. He was one of the principal architects of the president's emergency plan for AIDS relief, PEPFAR, a program that saved millions of lives throughout the developing world. And of co course, no one watching here today questions the immeasurable impact he has had and continues to have in our efforts to combat COVID-19. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Fauci. Thank you very much, Dr. Bowles. It's a real pleasure to be with you today. And as you can see from the slide, I'm going to be talking, as was mentioned, on the public health and scientific challenges of COVID-19. On this slide here, it's a shot of a cover of the Journal of the American Medical Association in a viewpoint that my colleagues and I published in January of this year at the very beginning of the realization of the challenge of COVID-19. Note that I gave as the title of this viewpoint, coronavirus infection more than just the common cold. I was by no means trying to be facetious, but I wanted to bring out to the readers that we had been dealing with coronavirus infections for decades and decades. And that really informs where we are now with it. This phylogenetic tree of the coronaviruses show the human coronaviruses in red but we know now from extensive work that particularly bats are important reservoirs as are intermediate hosts. The four coronaviruses that are highlighted in yellow are the four common cold coronaviruses, 
which infect and reinfect all of us each year, usually in the winter months. And we've known this for decades and decades. However, in 2002, we were struck with the first pandemic coronavirus to our knowledge. There could have been prior history that it could have been pandemics before recorded history. But in our knowledge, the first was the 2002 SARS uh, coronavirus and then the 2012 MERS coronavirus. We have had significant experience with these. The SARS, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, came from Guangdong province in China, from a bat, likely to a civet cat, and then to a human. It became a pandemic with 8,000 cases and almost 800 deaths. But by pure public health measures alone, it was contained successfully and essentially eliminated. It had a 10% mortality, but its efficiency of spread from human to humans was limited. Then in 2012 came the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome or MERS, again from a bat to a camel to a human. It is still smoldering in the Middle East and continues to get reintroduced, but it has not turned out, even though it has pandemic potential, it has not turned out to be a true pandemic. And then fast forward to today, the third pandemic coronavirus, first recognized in the Wuhan section of central China as an unusual cases of pneumonia, which in January of 2020 was identified as a new strain of a coronavirus. And then now when we look back at the phylogenetic tree, we see its phylogenetic proximity to the original SARS coronavirus, which made a shuffling of nomenclature where the original is called SARS coronavirus one and the new virus now is referred to as SARS coronavirus two. To be sure the terminology is such that the disease itself is called COVID-19 for coronavirus disease 2019 because it was first recognized in December of 2019. And as I mentioned, the virus itself is referred to as SARS coronavirus 2. So where are we now with this? Fast forward to today. As of two days ago, we know now that we are living through a historic pandemic, the likes of which we have not experienced as a civilization in the last 102 years since the iconic 1918 Spanish flu, as it was called at the time. Well, there are now about 40 million cases globally and over 1,100,000 deaths. The United States has been the most severely hit of all the countries in the world, again, with about 8 million cases and now closing in on 218,000 deaths. The heat map of the individual states shown here indicates the number of cases per 100,000, as you can see the distribution throughout the states of the United States. Now, I wanna point out something that I think would be informative of how we can understand the differences of what's going on here versus taking Europe for an example. If you look at this slide, the blue line is the peaking of cases in the European Union very slightly before the peaks in the United States. It was predominantly in Northern Italy and then spread to the rest of the European Union. However, what happened is that when the European Union shut down, as it were, their baseline cases went way below 10,000, a few thousand per day, and stayed that way for a while until most recently, when you see that blue line skyrocket up, as today, even as I speak to you, Europe is seeing a major resurgence in their attempt to open up, as well as the fact that they are in the Northern Hemisphere and many activities are going indoor. But look at the United States. New York metropolitan area was predominantly responsible for the major peak we see on the red line between March and April. However, when they got hit badly and recovered, note that the baseline of the United States did not go down 
much at all. It stayed at around 20,000 and then soared up in June as we try to so-called open up the economy. And many states did not do that in a uniform way, abiding by the guidelines which we put together. When that peaked and came down, now today we are faced with another surgeons where the daily cases range between 55 and 70,000 per day. But getting back to the fact that we never went down to a baseline and trying to figure out why that's the case, it's multifaceted, but here's one of the potential reasons why. When you measure by mobility with GPSs over time and compare the United States with Italy and Spain as representative of the European Union, Note that when you talk about visits to parks and outdoor spaces, we did not shut down nearly as much as our colleagues in Italy and Spain. When you talk about workplaces, the same. Look at the United States line compared to Italy and Spain. This is particularly dramatic when you look at things like visits to grocery and pharmacy stores when you compare the United States to Italy and Spain. So although we say we did shut down, we did not shut down as strictly and as stringently as countries in the European Union, as well as those in Asia. So let me switch now to a bit very quickly to the virology. As I mentioned just a moment ago, this is a beta coronavirus and RNA virus with a large genome of 30,000 KB, multiple structural proteins, the most important of which is the spike protein, particularly the receptor binding domain, which binds to the now well-recognized receptor ACE2, which is distributed widely throughout the body in the upper and lower respiratory tract, the GI tract, and even in myocardial tissue. With regard to transmission, clearly this is a respiratory-borne virus spread by respiratory droplets, but most recently it has become clear that aerosols namely particles small enough to be able to stay within the air for periods of time ranging from multiple seconds to multiple minutes and even longer, particularly indoors when there isn't adequate dispersion. Less commonly, there's contact through contaminated surfaces. The virus is found in a number of body fluids, but their role in transmission is unknown and likely not significant. This is a light diffraction of a cough or a sneeze, but I show it to you to remind me to tell you that the virus can be spread in an asymptomatic way without any coughs or sneezes. And in fact, the risk of transmission varies by the type and duration of exposure, including factors such as viral load. Transmission is the most common in, common in household contacts and in congregate settings particularly when it's closed, such as cruise ships, nursing homes, and prisons. The fact is that may increase the risk of airborne transmission are things that we wouldn't expect, such as just singing or speaking loudly or breathing heavily. This is one of the reasons why it's so important for, to abide by the public health measures that we talk about and I'll mention in a moment. These are some of the examples of congregate settings the now famous Skagit County, Washington, spread in a super spreader event in a choir in the state of Washington, where one infected individual infected 87% of the group. Also, there have been a number of reports of family gatherings, church gatherings, where people are congregated together without masks, leading to super spreader events. The CDC has just published this chart of the risk and the ratio that you see of getting infected in places like restaurants, particularly that are closed with poor ventilation, indoor, gyms, bars, and even some church and religious gatherings. One of the most extraordinary aspects of this outbreak is that unlike any other infection that I've ever dealt with, about 40 to 45% of infected individuals are without symptoms and by modeling studies, we know that a substantial proportion of the transmissions occur from an asymptomatic person to an uninfected individual. So what are some of the fundamental principles to prevent the acquisition and transmission? I name them as five. Universal wearing of masks or cloth face covering. 
maintaining physical distance at least six feet where possible, avoiding crowds in congregate settings, particularly indoors, do things outdoors to the extent possible much more than you would do indoors and do frequent washing of hands. Things as simple as that without necessarily shutting down the country can have a major impact on inhibiting acquisition and transmission. Quickly, the clinical manifestations early on very similar to a flu-like syndrome as shown on this slide with a peculiar and interesting in some individuals loss of smell and taste that generally precedes the onset of respiratory symptoms. As I mentioned, 40 to 45% of people have no symptoms. Those that do, overwhelming majority, about 80% have mild to moderate symptoms where about 15 to 20% have severe or critical symptoms leading to hospitalizations, sometimes intensive care, mechanical ventilatory support leading to the case fatality, which ranges from a few percent to as high as 20 to 25%, particularly for those requiring mechanical ventilation. The manifestations of severe disease are plentiful, predominantly the <clears throat> respiratory distress syndrome. However, we are starting to notice as we get more and more experience, that there's a considerable degree of cardiac dysfunction, arrhythmias, cardiomyopathy, often leading to sudden death, kidney injury, neurological disorders, a peculiar hypercoagulability with microthrombi in small vessels and thromboembolic phenomenon leading to stroke, sometimes in otherwise normal individuals, and a curious multisystem inflammatory syndrome in children, very reminiscent of Kawasaki syndrome. Some individuals, and we're studying this intensively now, are talking about and really experiencing a post-COVID-19 syndrome of lingering symptomatology of shortness of breath, fatigue, um, muscle aches, temperature dysregulation, and some even requiring or, 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 or describing what they call a brain fog or an inability to concentrate. We're putting a major study on seeing exactly the extent of this post-COVID-19 syndrome. People at increased risk for severe COVID illness or include older adults. It's very clear when you look at this particular graph about the extraordinary difference in hospitalization rate per 100,000 population of younger individuals on the left-hand part of the slide and the elderly as shown on the bars as we go from left to right. Also people of any age with certain underlying medical conditions. And those are shown on the slide. Some particularly to mention chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, obesity, diabetes, and a number of heart conditions. These are clearly associated with increased risk. Others may be associated. I'll point out a few that are important. Hypertension, diabetes, again, overweight, as well as immunocompromised states. In the United States, about 40% of US adults are susceptible to severe COVID-19 disease on the basis of underlying conditions, as well as aging in individuals, even those with overlapping compromised conditions. So the idea of being able to just let this infection go through the community and only be concerned about those in nursing homes clearly is flawed because there are so many people that are generally in the community who are susceptible to severe disease. There are also significant racial and ethnic disparities, not only in the incidence and prevalence of getting infected because of the nature of the jobs that African-Americans, Latinx, Native Americans, and others have, but because of the underlying condition. This is a very striking slide. If you look at the rate of hospitalization per 100,000 population, Look at Hispanic, Latino, American Indian, and Blacks in the 300 plus compared to whites at 86. Quickly, going on to therapeutics, the NIH has put together a treatment guidelines panel with experts from all over the country and even the world who examine on a very regular basis clinical data as it becomes available and put into a living document which is accessible on the link on this slide in real time, allowing clinicians 
throughout the country and the world to know what the latest approach towards the management and treatment of individuals with COVID-19. Two of the drugs, remdesivir and dexamethasone, I'll get to in a moment, but there are other investigational drugs that are being actively tested. Blood-derived products like convalescent plasma and hyperimmune globulin, a lot of excitement about monoclonal antibodies, a number of clinical trials ongoing, as well as immunomodulators such as cytokine inhibitors. Remdesivir is a direct antiviral that was the first that was shown in a randomized placebo-controlled trial of hospitalized individuals with lung disease to significantly diminish the time to recovery. In addition, the UK, our colleagues in, in, uh, in the UK, did a randomized placebo-controlled trial of dexamethasone in over 6,000 individuals, showing that individuals who are hospitalized requiring ventilation or oxygen had a significant diminution in 28-day mortality. So these are drugs that are now being used widely in advanced disease. Finally, with regard to vaccines, there are now many vaccines throughout the world, at least 11 that are in a advanced phase three trial. The United States has taken what we call a strategic approach to COVID-19 vaccine R&D, as was delineated by my colleagues and I in this recent paper in Science. The United States government has invested hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars in partnering with pharmaceutical companies, either in the development of the vaccine or the facilitation of the testing, as well as the advanced purchase of hundreds of millions of doses. By strategic approach, I'm talking about a harmonized type of a protocol approach with common data and safety monitoring boards, common primary and secondary endpoints, and common immunological parameters for correlates of immunity so that we can be able to compare to some extent one vaccine to another. These are the three major platforms, nucleic acid, particularly mRNA, viral vectors, chimp adeno, human adeno, and VSV, as well as the more standard protein subunit. As I mentioned, of the six that are being supported, five are in phase three clinical trials, two of which began on July 27. And as you look at the rate of infection in our community and look at the sites that are doing the trial, we can project that we will get an answer as to the safety and efficacy of a vaccine sometime likely by mid-November or early December. I have said, and I'll repeat for this audience, that I'm cautiously optimistic based on the animal data and based on the phase one trials that showed a robust neutralizing antibody response comparable to, if not a little better than natural infection convalescent plasma, that we will have a safe and effective vaccine and maybe more than one by the end of this year, the beginning of next year, and hopefully be able to distribute vaccine doses to those who are the most vulnerable. And again, there's no guarantee when you're dealing with vaccines, but we remain cautiously optimistic. One of the problems we'll face is getting people to take the vaccine. On this slide, if you look at the yellow and the orange, that's a combination of people who don't want the vaccine or are not sure, which means that 50% of Americans get a plan to get a vaccine, whereas the others don't. And it would be a terrible shame if we have, and I think we will have, a safe and effective vaccine, but we're not able to widely distribute it, particularly for those who need it. I'll close with this final slide, which is the website of the COVID-19 Prevention Network. You can get on this site and get an idea of all of the prevention modalities that are being tested. And in fact, if anyone is interested in even expressing an interest in participating in the trial, you can do so through this website. I'll stop there and thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to make this presentation. Please join me in thanking Dr. Fauci for his remarks. Now it's my pleasure to introduce the distinguished moderator of our first panel, Dr. Sanjay Gupta. 
Dr. Gupta serves as chief medical correspondent for CNN and is a practicing neurosurgery at Emory Hospital in Atlanta. Plays an integral role in CNN's reporting on health and medical news for all of the network's broadcasts domestically and internationally, and regularly contributes uh, to CNN.com. Dr. Gupta is Associate Professor of Neurosurgery at Emory and serves as Associate Chief of Neurosurgery at Grady Memorial Hospital. A member of the National Academy of Medicine since 2019, he's received multiple Emmy Awards and is the author of three New York Times uh, bestselling books, Chasing Life, Cheating Death, and Monday Mornings from 2012. His fourth book, Keep Sharp, Building a Better Brain, is going to be published early in 2021. Dr. Gupta received both his undergraduate degree and his MD from the University of Michigan. Throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, Dr. Gupta has become an even more familiar face across America, and he's worked tirelessly and faithfully to bring us all timely information that we can believe and trust. Please welcome Dr. Sanjay Gupta. Thank you, Dr. Balser. Um, it's a real honor for me to be here. I've uh, really remarking uh, nine months into this, I'm still learning so much as we all are about this, uh, this pandemic and this virus. Dr. Fauci, thank you. Bill Gates, thank you as well. Uh, I'm really excited to, to be here and I'm honored to now be a part of this, this National Academy as well. Um, I think it's safe to say that this, the role of the National Academy is more important than ever. People looking for verifiable, trusted knowledge and this certainly this academy is, has been a source of that for a long time. I also, uh, we have a lot to discuss, but I also just want to say that, um, you know, the tireless work of, of scientists all over the world has been really inspiring and it is worth celebrating. Uh, we have some, we've been going through a very tough time, obviously here in the States, many places around the world, but it is worth celebrating some of the incredible work of these scientists as well. Uh, this first panel, we want to talk about, obviously, COVID-19, talk about the history, as Dr. Fauci has already laid out a bit, but what does that history mean in terms of where we've been over the last nine months, where we are now, and where we have to go, not only for this pandemic, but also future pandemics. So I'm going to introduce um, three speakers. We're going to hear from them. Um, they're going to give us uh, viewpoints. We're going to have a moderated discussion after that for about a half an hour. Dr. Fauci will join us for that moderated discussion. And then we also want to hear from you, the audience. We want to take your questions. So there is a, a question and answer tool at the bottom of your live feed. Go ahead and start submitting your questions as they come in. Uh, we, will, we will take those uh, for the last 30 minutes or so. So let me introduce our first speaker. And again, we'll hear from all three speakers and then get into the discussion. Uh, Susan Weiss, um, she's professor and vice chair in the Department of Microbiology at the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. She's co-director of the Penn Center for Research on Coronaviruses and Other Emerging Pathogens. She, I've had a chance to hear her. Uh, you're gonna learn a lot. She's a real leader in the field of coronaviruses, having worked on aspects of coronavirus replication and pathogenesis over the last 40 years, just about as long as Dr. Fauci, making contributions, understanding the basic biology of replication, as well as the determinants of organ virulence. Um, she's worked with uh, on SARS as well, MERS, CoV, and most recently, obviously, focusing on the pathogenesis of SARS-CoV-2. Um, her work really over the last 10 years has focused on coronavirus interactions with the innate immune response and, and therefore the viral innate antagonists and antiviral pathways. Um, as I mentioned, she's at the University of Pennsylvania, but got her BA at Brandeis and her PhD in microbiology from Harvard. Um, Susan, thanks so much for joining us. Welcome. Thank you. I'm really honored to be here. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, the history of coronaviruses and then the three epidemics caused by the zoonotic coronaviruses that have emerged into humans in the last 20 years. And then I want to talk about how uh, the biology of the viruses or what we've learned about these viruses informs vaccine and drug uh, therapy strategies, as well as how to prepare for zoonotic viruses that will very likely emerge in the future. And uh, some of these topics were co covered by Dr. Fauci, so I, I hope that my talk will complement his talk from maybe a different perspective. Um, so let me get started. Um, uh, coronaviruses are, are a family within the nidovirus order, and they're characterized by this uh, corona-like or crown-like morphology that can be, can be seen here in this image taken in, electron, in an electron microscope. 
The coronavirus particle is shown here. It's really, really rather simple. There's, a, it's got a, coronaviruses have a very long RNA genome, the long, longest genome that we know of, RNA viruses. And um, that RNA is complex with the nucleocapsid protein and is in this helical uh, formation inside of the virus particle. The nucleocapsid is surrounded by a membrane that's derived from the host cell. And in the membrane, there are three proteins. As Dr. Fauci uh, described, the spike protein is uh, the protein of, about, of, against which most vaccines are directed. This is a really important protein in, in that it mediates binding to the receptor and uh, cell, to, cell to virus fusion, in which lets the viral nucleocapsid enter the cell. This protein is really an important determinant also of the tropism of the virus, the immune response, and the extent of virulence. Um, there are two other proteins in the membrane, membrane protein and small membrane protein, and both of these play important roles in the virus life cycle. And then some coronaviruses also encode a hemagglutinin and esterase, kind of like the influenza HA. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 does not encode this protein. Uh, the coronavirus timeline. I'm going to go back to the 1960s when uh, the first human coronaviruses appeared in the literature, OC43 and 229E. These are the common cold viruses. Uh, OC43 can also occasionally infect the lower respiratory tract. And by this time, we also knew a lot about uh, animal coronaviruses that infect many species of animals. And there was a lot of vaccine development performed on these viruses uh, way back, even before uh, we knew about the human viruses. Um, so then for the next 20 years or so, there was a lot of work done on the basic biology of coronaviruses um, by a small group of, of researchers. Um, and this was a lot of this work was done using the mouse hepatitis virus, the model virus, the infectious bronchitis virus, of chickens, uh, the bovine coronavirus, and not so much on these human viruses. But the, we learned a lot about viral entry, virus replication, and also how viruses interacted with their hosts. So that in 2002, when SARS coronavirus uh, emerged in, in uh, southern China, the coronavirus community, as, rest of the, as, as, as well as the rest of the world, were really quite shocked to see a, a human coronavirus that could cause such severe disease. We knew that animal coronaviruses could do so, but this was the first for the human viruses. And I'll talk about the epidemic a little more in a moment. And one of the things we learned in the wake of that was that bats were a major reservoir for coronaviruses, as well as many other viruses that were really not very um, virulent for bats, but were quite lethal in humans. And the other thing that happened in the in the um, in the uh, in the wake of the SARS epidemic was that people looked for other coronaviruses, human coronaviruses, and really only two more were identified: HKU1 and NL63, causing pneumonia and bronchiolitis, respectively. And then things were pretty quiet in the land of coronavirus research until 2012, when Middle East Respiratory Virus Syndrome Virus, or MERS, emerged in, in the Arabian Peninsula. Um, and as Dr. Fauci said, this virus is still causing infections, and I'll talk about it in a moment. And then things were quiet again. Um, we weren't quite as surprised when MERS emerged as SARS, but still quite shocked. And in, at the end of 2019, when SARS coronavirus 2 emerged in China, um, I guess we were kind of surprised, but not that surprised because we already knew that this could happen, had happened twice before. And of course, SARS uh, stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Disease Syndrome. And, um, and as, as Dr. Fauci said, coronavirus disease 219 is COVID-19. And it's kind of like SARS-CoV-2 is the virus and COVID-19 is the disease in analogy to HIV and AIDS. So I want to talk about each of these epidemics in a little more detail. So uh, SARS-CoV-2 was the first interspecies transmission that we know of, but, I'm, I'm, but well, actually there were others before that, but the first lethal human virus that we know of that um, emerged from bats, it was probably most likely transferred to a civet cat and then to humans. And then once in humans, it spread very rapidly by close contact and spread. This is the map. Most of the most of SARS was confined to Asia, 87% in China and Hong Kong. There was an outbreak in Toronto. People traveled from Hong Kong to many parts of Asia and to Toronto spreading the virus. And there were about 8,000 infections with about 10% mortality. And we don't really know how many times this happened. Um, but we know that it's that the virus does not have a reservoir in, in civets, that it was just a transfer. MERS was a little bit different. MERS also has its origin in bats, which, which actually MERS does have a reservoir in camels. So, so MERS is transmitted from camels to humans and also to camels to camels. 
and then from humans, from camels to humans, but there's a more limited spread from humans to humans. Um, it stayed mostly in the Arabian Peninsula, except for an outbreak in Korea, which was started by someone traveling from uh, the Arabian Peninsula to Korea. Um, Camels are a reservoir, so many, many camels have MERS, and they, they get a cold from camels. They don't get uh, lethal disease. Um, and there are still new cases in 2020. I just looked look this up. There are about 2,500 cases, with and, and, and MERS is actually has a higher mortality rate than SARS or SARS-2. So a little bit different from the uh, SARS epidemic. And then we have the SARS-CoV-2 epidemic. Uh, which again, we know started at the end of 2019, most likely came from a bat. I think the evidence to date is pretty convincing that, that there are ancestral viruses to SARS-CoV-2 in bats. Um, there was a lot of uh, talk about uh, SARS uh, coming from uh, directly from uh, a pangolin. I think that's probably the data would suggest to me that it's probably not the case. Um, but and that that this the given the the um, sort of the bioinformatics that's been done on this virus, I think it's possible that it, it was transmitted directly to humans, but we really don't know. And once it got into humans, it clearly spread really quickly, as we all know, know all over the world. And here's the map. Uh, this, there are now 40 million infections and 8 million um, in, the, in the U.S. So each one of these um, epidemics was slightly different. The epidemiology of the viruses is really different. And I just want to say one more thing about the bat origin of these viruses. Um, and this is sort of in response to the conspiracy theory that's been floated about. Um, how do we know that SARS-CoV-2 was not engineered by humans? I mean, I'm convinced that it's not. There are similar viruses, ancestral viruses found in bats. It doesn't resemble any known recombinant viruses. So when you make a virus de novo, you really need a starting material. And it's not possible. I think it's not possible for anyone to know how to design a virus with the properties of SARS-CoV-2, that is the pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic spread as opposed to SARS-CoV-1. Okay, I wanna look at the genomes of these viruses. Um, the, these viruses are divided into, as Dr. Fauci told you, into different genera and different lineages based on their sequence and their genome organization. Um, so all coronaviruses, uh, so among the human coronaviruses, we find there are two alpha coronaviruses, 229E and NL63. Uh, the OC43 and HQ1 are uh, lineage A or Mbeco viruses. SARS-CoV SARS is a SARBeco or lineage B beta coronavirus. And MERS is also a beta coronavirus, only lineage C. All of these viruses have the same, uh, very similar genome structure, this very long replicase gene that encodes 16 non-structural proteins. Then the uh, spike protein and the other structural proteins are arrayed in the same order shown here, S, E, M, and N. Um, and what's different about uh, yeah, and what's different about these is that this three prime end here, accessory proteins are different for each virus. And these are important proteins in terms of uh, combating host response. SARS-CoV-2 was sequenced very quickly and identified by its sequence and by its genome structure to be a SARBeco or lineage B virus and hence the name SARS-CoV-2. I just want to look at the spike proteins for a moment. So we know now that th this is the major protein against which vaccines are developed and also the protein against the monoclonal antibody uh, therapies. And so these spike proteins are very similar structurally among all the coronaviruses, but they're pretty different in sequence. For example, between SARS and MERS, they, these two virus groups use different receptors. So a vaccine directed against SARS would very unlikely work against MERS and a vaccine directed against SARS-CoV-2 may or may not work against any future um, emergent coronavirus. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, however, the replicase proteins are highly conserved and present many targets for possible um, therapies or for drug therapies. And I just wanna look at that in a little more detail. Um, here's the, uh, the proteins encoded by, um, by the replicase gene of, of coronaviruses. There are 16 of them. Um, and we, among them are these two proteases and an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. This uh, replicates the viral genome, 
Uh, these two proteases are important for processing these proteins from long precursors. And all of these uh, have been both replicases and proteases have been successful drug targets for other viruses, for example, HIV or HCV. And of course, remdesivir that we all heard about is targeting the RNA uh, dependent RNA polymerase. However, coronaviruses have many other enzymes um, that could be possibly drug targets. Uh, several of these enzymes are part of the replicase complex for replicating RNA. Others are really important for combating host responses and for protecting the viral RNA uh, from, from, the, from the host uh, antiviral responses. So many of these are possible targets for, for uh, sort of pan-coronavirus antivirals because their structures are highly conserved. Um, so just uh, in, in conclusion, uh, just some recommendations to prepare for future emergent viruses. Obviously, vaccine development is really important and monoclonal antibody treatments. And as I said, as we said, these are going to be more specific for the particular virus for SARS-CoV-2 at the moment, all, all these um, therapies in clinical trials. Um, and while, while a SARS-CoV vaccine may not work against a future virus, certainly the development of platforms uh, that are going to be successful can be adapted uh, for, for uh, more rapidly producing vaccines or, or antibodies against any future virus that may emerge. And uh, developing pan-coronavirus antivirals are really important for more quick re response to any new virus that, that may um, may emerge and not be responsive to, to vaccines that we already have. Um, I also think it's important to continue to identify and characterize coronaviruses and other viruses from bats and other species. It's important to know what's out there and what can possibly spill over into humans. And lastly, I think it's important to support basic virology research because it's only by really understanding these viruses that we can even think about um, how to fight them and how to prepare for, for future ones. And I just wanna acknowledge uh, the people in my lab and all the other uh, scientists that are working really hard on these viruses under quite stressful conditions in the biosafety lab um, and also the funding uh, of NIH for, for these kinds of projects. And I will stop there. Thank you. Susan, thank you very much. Uh, that, was, that was terrific. I, I wanna make sure everyone can hear still. Good, okay. Um, Thank you. And we'll get back to you in, in just a few minutes uh, to, for some moderated Q&A. And again, people who are watching, if you want to submit questions, you do have the tool. Let me go ahead and introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Nicole Lurie. She's currently the Strategic Advisor to the CEO for the Coalition uh, for Epidemic Preparedness, CEPI. She's a senior lecturer at Harvard Medical School. She's a member of the research faculty at Massachusetts General Hospital, professor of medicine at George Washington University School of Medicine. And she also served an eight-year term as Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. When she was there, she led the uh, HHS response to numerous public health emergencies, infectious diseases, yes, but also natural and man-made disasters, and is responsible for many of the innovations in emergency and preparedness and response that we still talk about today. She chaired the Public Health Emergency Medical Countermeasures Enterprise that's a government-wide organization, ultimately responsible for the development of medical countermeasures. Um, she got her BA and her MD also from the University of Pennsylvania, did her residency and her public health training at UCLA, and is a member of this academy, the National Academy of Medicine. Dr. Lurie, welcome. Thank you so much. It's just a, a pleasure and an honor to be here. What we've just been hearing, a testament to years of amazing scientific work and investment just before COVID began, though, the Global, the Global Pandemic Monitoring Board asked the National Academies to assess progress and gaps in the global R&D ecosystem. And Dr. Zhao turned to my colleague, Jerry Kirsch, and myself to do this. So I wanted to take this opportunity to share some of our observations through the lens of this evolving pandemic. And then I think since most of us attending this meeting are American, provide a bit of a more global context for what we're seeing. Next slide, please. The R&D ecosystem is a phrase first coined by industry to think about how to accelerate the transition from basic science to products for various diseases. As a lesson learned after the H1N1 pandemic, my colleagues and I were able to do considerable thinking about this ecosystem and came to terms with the fact that although things went relatively well, 
we missed really important opportunities to generate new knowledge, and we needed to be better prepared to conduct research during emergencies. Coming to the same realization on the other side of the Atlantic, Globid R, a coalition of global funders spearheaded by the European Commission, formed to support preparedness research and intended through monitoring new outbreaks to try to make early research available to them, uh, funding available to respond to them. So while this thinking set us up to deal with some aspects of the 2014-15 Ebola epidemic in West Africa, it wasn't until the world said never again that we started taking preparedness R&D more seriously. The WHO published its priority pathogen list, as well as an R&D blueprint, and incorporated research into its emergency response framework. And CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, was formed as an international NGO to do vaccine development for potentially epidemic diseases. Next slide, please. So when COVID began, we started to see the benefits of pre-positioning some of the science response. For example, GizAid, created as a sequencing repository for influenza viruses, rapidly pivoted to become the go-to entity for depositing gene sequences. We've been seeing the benefits of the NIAID prototype pathogen approach, pre-positioning investments to develop vaccines against pathogen families, products with specifics of which you're still a little bit unsure of and even more unsure when you're gonna need them, but nonetheless getting those platforms in place. I also want to highlight another pre-position science response effort, the recovery trial, that adaptive platform trial in the UK that provided us the early results about hydroxychloroquine and dexamethasone. This was built on a pre-position generic protocol and a network of institutions conducting ongoing inter-epidemic research on influenza largely with the express intent that they be ready to pivot if and when needed. So we're getting better. Next slide, please. But our work also noted a number of gaps. Having spent now a lot of time in the US government before working for a global institution, I will confess I have really taken the US system for granted. This isn't a comment on the science per se, because we've seen phenomenal science and collaboration around the world, but about the way things are organized and governed. So when COVID started, we asked, for example, whose responsibility was it to grow up and share virus? A lot of people pointed us to the US CDC, but it wasn't really clear that this was their responsibility on behalf of the world. And similarly, for things like the collection of biological reference material needed to develop things like standardized assays or validation panels for diagnostic tests, we saw that the US government uh, funded that in the United States, but there's not really an entity charged with doing this on a global scale. And the list goes on, and I'll let you take a look at the slide here, um, and all of these enabling science components for which by and large, there wasn't a clear owner or much standardization. Next slide, please. But for me, when it came to product development, this is for me where I really saw so many of those differences really occur. In the US, the US government funds the basic science, it funds the advanced development, it funds the clinical trials, it funds the manufacturer of vaccine, it guarantees that it's gonna buy the vaccine if somebody makes it, and then it buys doses for the American people and will pay to distribute it and administer that. That is not the case in the rest of the world. There is no go-to entity to financing the manufacture of vaccines at scale. There's no go-to entity to guarantee companies are gonna get paid if they do it at risk or to buy doses on behalf of the world. So that was really a gap. Fast forward to now, where an entity called COVAX, which is a collaboration of Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, WHO and CEPI, have now stood up a joint procurement facility the idea being that if countries banded together to invest in a portfolio of vaccine candidates, some will be successful and they can buy a vaccine for the world. There is a bunch of overlap with warp speed in terms of these candidates and CEPI seeded and funded the early development of these candidates, but the portfolio is growing. So is the number of countries that have joined and now 180 countries around the world have joined this effort, but not yet the United States. And importantly, there is still not enough money to fund this entire effort, 
which means that even with a successful vaccine, production will be slower than it could be. And bilateral deals between rich countries and manufacturers may well mean that poorer countries again get vaccine late in the game. Next slide, please. It's clear that we've seen some ongoing and important science preparedness gaps in the US as well. And I wanna take a moment to highlight just a couple. First is the system for developing evidence for how to treat a new disease. We've been in a situation now for months in which a few thousand clinicians are on calls run by Project ECHO and HHS, but no mechanism to rapidly turn interesting clinical observations into trials that can produce evidence about how to care for people with a new disease. Well, NIH has developed adapted therapeutics trials and has had longstanding vaccine trial networks for a while, for years. There was no real standing infrastructure at the beginning of this to rapidly and efficiently trial therapeutics. So companies have been competing for sites and for patients around the country, and many studies are unlikely to yield real data. Third, COVID has unmasked for us in this country longstanding issues about inequality and racism. And there is a ton of science work to do to better understand how these issues impact on health. And finally, while politics is always a part of any emergency, it has not interfered with science in the way we've seen with this pandemic. Going forward, I think we're gonna need at least some good social science to figure out how to prevent this kind of thing in the future. Next slide, please. So how can we move forward? A few thoughts. I would propose, for example, that the world could come together on a, and agree on these core enabling science needs like the ones on the prior slides. And we could pre-position pre hubs, potentially one on each continent. Global research funders like GLOPIDAR could pre-position funding instead of have to issue a call for proposal when something happens. So pre-position that funding to be immediately releasable to these go-to entities, these hubs that take responsibility as go-to entities uh, in a crisis. And then clearly there needs to be pre-position financing for global R&D end to end, starting with the kind of work that Dr. Weiss is talking about and ending with what I think you'll probably hear from Dr. Chikwe in a little while, uh, getting products to people and getting the public health response down in the next pandemic. We cannot be passing a tin cup the next time around. Next slide, please. Can we get to an end to end finance system by the next time? I certainly hope that we can get a lot closer going from that front end to the back end. And next slide. I'm optimistic, next slide please. I'm optimistic about some of these parts. Global organizations with European leadership built something called the ACT Accelerator, the Access to COVID Tools Accelerator to deal with a crisis at hand. It's been inspiring for me to see globalism at work, but to reach its goals this ACT Accelerator needs about $35 billion to finish development, procurement and distribution of diagnostics, therapeutics and vaccines. And granted, when you think about it, it is less than a week of loss of global GDP, but it has still been very, very hard to raise the rest of the funds. So while it's trying to solve problems here and now, it's gonna need some substantial adjustment, I think going forward, but that's the work ahead. Coming back to the US, while the world is in some sense moving forward, taking advantage of a lot of the work that has been done at NIH and uh, CDC and FDA, um, it's moving forward a little bit without us. And it's my sincere hope that the US government with all that it has to offer and all that it has to gain from the global scientific collaboration around the world will ultimately join this effort. None of this, however, is a substitute for country capacity, country readiness, and the ability to learn to do things better each time, including to have a better prepared R&D ecosystem. And in that vein, Dr. Chikwe, who you're gonna hear about next, has been an inspiration to me, and I'm sure he will be to you. Thank you. Dr. Lurie, thank you so much. Um, uh, and again, we are going to we are going to have a moderated discussion here in just a little bit. Please submit your questions. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Chikwe Ihuazu. Uh, he's the Director General of the Nigerian Center for Disease Control. 
and was until January of 2018, the acting director of the Regional Center for Disease Control for West Africa. Uh, Dr. Ikewazu, uh, he trained as an infectious disease epidemiologist and has over 20 years of experience working in senior public health and leadership positions in several national public health institutes, including the South African National Institute for Communicable Diseases, the UK's Health Protection Agencies, and Germany's Robert Koch Institute. Uh, he has led several short-term engagements for WHO, mainly in response to major infectious disease outbreaks around the world, including COVID-19. Uh, Chikwe, thanks so much for joining us. Welcome. Sorry. Thank, thanks, Dr. Gupta. Uh, thanks a lot for your very kind introduction. And um, this has really been just amazing listening to all the presenters ahead of me. It's really been a tour of the force through, through the science of COVID from discovery to basic science from transmission dynamics to the evolution of interventions, vaccine development and deployment. You know, science has really provided us an, an understanding of this new disease at, at a rate faster than any other time in our history. Um, in, in Nigeria, where, where I currently lead the, the Nigeria Center for Disease Control, um, first slide, please. Um, we've had more than our own fair share of outbreaks over the last few years. Um, unfortunately, uh, Ebola in 2014, can, can we have the first slide if it's coming? Um, Ebola in 2014, uh, the re-emergence of the wild polio virus in 2016, a, a huge meningitis out, a outbreak in, in 2017 together with the, with the re-emergence of monkeypox in Nigeria. And, and last year, we reported the highest number of uh, Lassa fever cases ever, a viral hemorrhagic fever. M many people are on, the, on, on this program may not even have heard about with a case fatality ratio of about 20%. And, and now COVID with 60,000 60, cases in Nigeria, a lot less than some other countries, but it's, it's where we are at the moment. So with the outbreaks we have had, it, it's it's not totally surprising that this is happening in Nigeria. You know, we have one of the, the highest population densities in the world, um, climatic conditions that are perfect for the transmission of viruses and, and social economic conditions that we're not proud of, but it's where we are. So despite all of this, despite all of this and all these diseases and all these outbreaks, it's been very difficult to, to get scientific endeavor to focus on these diseases over the last few years. Uh, this is not helped by the fact that many of these diseases disproportionately affect countries in the global south. And, and unfortunately, there's just not enough commercial interest to produce vaccines, diagnostics, therapeutics. And, and therefore, the emergence of CEPI has really been a game changer for us. And we hope that this will dramatically to change the interest of, of the global community in these diseases. But, but we desperately need an increased focus on science, the science of emerging infectious diseases. And, and in my role as the leader of the Nigeria Center for Disease Control, I have continuously made the case for, for greater attention and funding for, for epidemic preparedness, which of course includes both financial and human capital investment in science. Here in Nigeria, we're, we're working very hard to build our science capacity, and we, we continue to learn from other countries around the world that have made significant pro progress in their use of science uh, to guide evidence-based decision-making. We are looking not only at the premium placed on good science, but its relevance in the decisions that our, our leaders are making. As scientists and pu public health leaders, We've had to raise our voices during this outbreak, a lot more than we're generally comfortable with doing, especially in the face of increasing scrutiny and sometimes erosion of trust by the public. So when, you, when, when we follow the work that Dr. Fauci is doing and other colleagues on this panel, as well as many others globally, it's not only about doing great science, but it's also about communicating this clearly in a way that builds trust with the public 
and we as scientists need to learn how to better communicate cognizant of the geopolitics and motivations that often, do, often drive the decision being made by our political leaders. Uh, during this pandemic, in desperation for quick answers and solutions, many of our leaders and voices around the world have appeared skeptical of the need to follow trusted scientific advice and process. And, and this is a big risk for all of us, as, especially for us in this part of the world. We, we simply cannot afford to discredit science now and expect that when we do have a vaccine, it, it will be widely ac accepted by, by the same public who have become skeptical because of a vacuum of, of trust that may have been, been created. So, so this brings me in a way to my main point on, on the mechanisms needed to deliver the outputs of science into practice. Um, next slide. The, the, the Nigeria Center for Disease Control is our national public health institute. Similar to those that you see on this slide, you'll recognize the picture. Most people here will recognize the picture of the US CDC, but similar organizations exist in many countries in the world. Ours is a fairly young organization. The act that established us was just signed into law in November 2018. And it will come to no one as a surprise that, you know, we, we modeled the, the Nigeria Center for Disease Control against a great center for disease control, the US Center for, great, uh, for Disease Control, and picked up pieces from other national public health institutes around the world. And as we all know, building science-led organizations can be slow. Uh, we often have to learn to adapt. Uh, but still, uh, you know, national public health institutes, they, they provide the link between science, some of the great science that you've listened to today, and implementation at the national, state, uh, local, and community levels. And, and even beyond NPIs, there's also the emergence of regional organizations. Maybe one of the biggest uh, successes after the Ebola outbreak in West Africa 2014-15 was the emergence of the Africa Centers for Disease Control. Uh, and its importance has been critical in this outbreak in bringing countries together and coordinating us. So we need, we, we just don't need, we also need regional and global organizations to provide the support and governance. Uh, and, you know, Nikki, alluded to some of that, because this is so important. It's almost more important with the regional and global organizations because there are no regional and global governments. So there, these organizations are much more important in bringing us uh, together, to work together, uh, because they rely a lot more on collaboration because there's no law uh, to possibly bring us together. So next slide. Um, this slide is actually adapted by, from one by uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Tom Frieden, who will also be familiar to many of you. Uh, a few years ago, he, he himself never wavered in his advocacy of using science and evidence to guide, public health, to guide the public health response to this pandemic. But th the slide really is so simple. It, it shows the various necessary functions of a national public health institute functions that need to be tightly coordinated. And yes, while some of these functions can be done in different ways and sometimes by different organizations, um, it's important to have a coordinating mechanism to bring them all together because it's only in bringing it together that we create the value that we need for public health. And um, this was our biggest lesson from the Ebola outbreak. This is really what drove the emergence of the Nigeria Center for Disease Control. And it's what has held together the response to the COVID outbreak now. I think it's, it's in our own enlightened collective self-interest to support strong national public health institutes and strong regional and global collaboration. M my vision is that we on the African continent are able to build strong science-led organizations to contribute and not just be recipients of global health security. And that this outbreak inspires a whole new generation of young Africans that will choose science as a career path and contribute to the, the work, the very hard work we will need to do over the next few years and decades 
to make the world a safer place. So I'll, I'll pause here now and look forward to the um, interesting conversation that I know lies ahead. Thank you very much, Sanjay. Chikwe, thank you very much. Uh, that was that was great. Let, let's go ahead and get to the to the discussion right away. I, I don't want to waste any time. But Chikwe, let me just just uh, build on what you were just saying. Um, what so what is the relationship right now then between the Nigerian CDC and the U.S. CDC? I mean, I, I, I don't. The news is what it is. People understand what's been going on. But how do you communicate? Uh, and are you still taking cues in, to any degree from the U.S. CDC? Oh, oh, absolutely. We, ha we have a very strong uh, relationship on the technical level. The U.S. CDC has a, a, main a big office in Nigeria, historically, from the HIV response. On, on a collegial, collaborative level, we are speaking all the time. Right now, we are collaborating in the implementation of a seroprevalence survey in Nigeria. So th these are friends, partners, and colleagues. In fact, the, the history of the NCDC. NCDC may never have happened if not for the support and very early work in building influenza surveillance systems. So influenza surveillance was where our molecular diagnostic capacity started in Nigeria. Out of a very small project, relatively funded and supported by the US CDC. So this is a relationship built on years of history and I'm sure will last many years into the future as we co-develop the tools that we need uh, for global health security for many years to come. You, you talk a lot, Chikwe, about linking the science to the public health response. Um, that is something you've talked about before. You've written about it. H how are how is that going? And, I, and, I, and you know, we can look at the numbers again of how things are going in Nigeria. But in terms of actually taking the science and applying it to the public health response, getting people to buy into it, sometimes getting people to understand um, something is a threat when they can't see it uh, is, is challenging. Um, we, we spent some time together during Ebola in 2014, but how about now, uh, linking that science to the public health response? Yeah, so, so it's, it's been as hard here as, as in, in almost every other country in the world, but I think what has happened here is um, our leadership really has listened to us from the very beginning. There has never been any ambiguity around where they get their advice from. Um, we've, we advised them from the beginning around a national lockdown, they took it, around stopping flights, they took it, at a very hard economic cost actually to Nigeria. I mean, we, we are still suffering and probably will suffer the consequences of that for, for many uh, months, probably years to come. So, but you know, whatever, there have been many kind of um, suggestions because of the desperation uh, uh, of this outbreak of, of potential cures, uh, potential remedies, um, many from other African countries as well, uh, you know, and lots of propositions to jump very quickly. But every time our leadership has come back to us and sought advice, and we have been, we've tried to provide them that advice as openly, as transparently, as possible with the limitations that comes with this. So I think it's work in progress right now. Of course, like in many countries, everyone is expecting the magic of a vaccine to emerge and for that to solve all our problems. And we have to continue communicating about the limitations of this expectation and manage public expectation while still um, you know, hoping that we do have a safe and effective vaccine that is actually available to countries like ours. So there are many parts of this from the science, the development side of things, and we're grateful for work going on around the country uh, and uh, around the world, but also grateful for organizations like CEPI and the COVAX facility that is actually actively thinking of very innovative mechanisms to make these vaccines equitably available to, to the rest of the world. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's safe, effective, and, and trusted vaccine, as, as Dr. Fauci was talking about. And, and, and Dr. Fauci, I mean, you, you, you showed this slide saying about 50% roughly of the country would be willing to get this vaccine right now. Vaccine hesitancy isn't, isn't necessarily a new thing, but, but beyond, beyond the obvious of you coming on and talking about it and talking about the process by which these vaccines are authorized or approved, what else can we be doing to increase that trust? 
Yeah. Well, Sanjay, I think one of the most important things, there are several things. One of them is in community engagement to get out into the community. And I, I'm referring spe specifically, although not exclusively, to our minority populations, African-Americans, uh, Latinx, Native Americans, and others, because of the understandable inherent mistrust of authority and mistrust of the government. If we can get community engagement, the way we did, Sanjay, you might remember when we were doing the first clinical trial uh, networks that Nikki had mentioned when she was talking about networks, um, we got the community involved because we wanted to make sure that the people who really needed to get involved in the clinical trials of prevention, of treatment or whatever for HIV would trust the, the system that the trials were ethically designed, scientifically sound to get them involved. So I think a very heavy dose of community engagement uh, with people who the community trust. The other thing is the consistency of the messages that are coming out from the government. And we've got to make sure that we try as best as we can not to have conflicting messages about vaccine and restore the trust in the organizations, the regulatory and otherwise. I think if people understood the things that go into a decision about whether a vaccine would be deemed safe and effective, including the Data and Safety Monitoring Board, which as you know, is an independent group, the career scientists at the uh, FDA, the VRPAC, which is the advisory committee to the FDA, all of those things are gonna be very carefully looking to make sure that a vaccine is not put out there unless it truly is safe and effective. If we can make that known, Sanjay, and articulate that well, together with the community engagement, I think we can go a long way to getting that 50% back into the fold of realizing the importance of getting vaccinated for themselves and for their community. And Dr. Lurie, I, I wanna talk specifically about some of these chronic structural uh, you know, um, divides that have made it so, have, have created this, this disproportionate impact on black and brown America. But just building on this vaccine uh, point that Dr. Fauci is making, 50% vaccine hesitancy. Do we know the populations that are most likely to be vaccine hesitant? Is it people, uh, is it people who are also most vulnerable to this disease? Or what, do, you, do you have any idea where the hesitancy mainly lies? Well, I think the hesitancy, quite frankly, is across the board. But having said that, all of the data I've looked at suggests that there is even greater hesitancy on African-American and Latinx and to some extent Native populations. You know, especially if you think back in the history of our country, uh, history of things like the Tuskegee experiment um, and others, those, is, those things loom really large uh, in the minds of many still. And that legacy of experimentation and distrust is still with us. So as Dr. Fauci said, I think really getting to uh, community leaders, trusted community leaders, spending time now, even thinking before we have a vaccine ready about vaccine literacy and understanding how people feel about vaccines and think about vaccines and starting to identify people in communities all over the country and frankly, all over the world um, who can do this kind of work is gonna be really, really critical. You've talked about the, the um, inequities that have been sort of unmasked. They've always been there, but they've been unmasked, really laid bare in the middle of this pandemic for people to see. Um, uh, again, this disproportionate impact on black and brown America. You've also said in some ways, it's the elephant in the room. I'm saying mm -hmm. people, you meant that people aren't discussing it enough because it, it is one of those things where I you say, is this, is this just the way that it is? And now we have to play catch up or should, should this have been addressed? And, and if so, how earlier? Well, I think that there are, I mean, are two issues here. Clearly we've known about, and for months now, even independent of COVID, we've been having a large national discussion, um, really for the first time in a very long time about the structural inequalities. And we've seen how these structural inequalities play out in uh, people getting infected uh, with the virus, as Dr. Fauci pointed out, and I think we know because of the kinds of jobs people have, because of the kinds of uh, places and conditions they live, because of living in multi-generational households, because of even access to testing that would let you have early diagnosis. 
Those things are all really, really important. But we also know, for example, that issues like chronic stress and chronic disadvantage probably also affect you in other ways. And in fact, a couple of years ago, there was a whole National Academy's annual meeting devoted to just that topic, sort of how is it that those sorts of stressors, which are part of what we see, let's say, with institutional racism and chronic inequality, how do those things translate into bad health above and beyond simply exposure? And while there is some work going on uh, in that area, it's nowhere near enough and it's time to really accelerate it. That's, it's really fascinating. And I hope we can spend a few more minutes talking about that. But Susan, before I get to you, I just want to ask Chikwe, can you, can you sort of contextualize the vaccine hesitancy in Nigeria? Just, just for some context here, do you, do you know what percentage of people are likely to take this or say they will? So we've, we've also tried to look at the numbers um, a bit. And th there's a historical perspective as well. Um, we've had like you know, a, a series of vaccine campaigns, mostly around polio, right? And, and that's also fairly uh, similar because, you know, polio was almost eliminated. So the value art for the series of vaccine campaigns to the average person was very little, right? Because of the risk of infection was very small. So on the other hand, when you have a, a meningitis outbreak, like we had a few years ago, there's a big demand because you know, this is a bad disease and people see um, um, the impact of it. So the, 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 the hesitancy seems to be increasing as because we have not had a bad, as bad an outbreak as many people thought we might have had at the beginning. On the other hand, and so there's a lot of work for us to do. On the, on the other hand, um, you know, th this outbreak has really affected our way, our way of life in, in Nigeria. You know, we, we, we're a country where we live together. We, we, we eat together, we dance together, we hug. You know, we're social people. And, 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 and therefore, the, the, the acts that we have to do, you know, the concept of social distancing is so challenging for us to implement. It's probably the same in many other country, but the countries as well. But, you know, it, it, this is really eating into our, our social fabric that I think that if a vaccine is going to enable us to do some of those things again, that we, there will be a lot of appetite for it. So I think the big issue for us, and one thing I worry, I, I think about a lot, is what type of vaccine will we get? Will we get a vaccine that will prevent infection? Uh, in a, or will we get a, a, a disease-modulating vaccine that, you know, may make you have a, a not as bad a clinical uh, event, but ultimately not prevent you uh, from being able to transmit to others? And, and that's a big question, really. And that's also a problem in, in measuring vaccine hesitancy at the moment, is that we really don't know um, the, the enough about the vaccine or vaccines that will be available for use, uh, um, you know, whenever they become available. Right, right. Um, Susan, I, I, I'm curious, I, I mean, this is the second time I've heard you speak and I always learn something, so I, I really appreciate that. When you look at the phylogenetics of these coronaviruses, you showed some of those slides. SARS, for example, you point out that there were some 8,000 infection people who were infected around the world and some 800 people who had died, roughly 10% mortality rate. And now we know what is happening, obviously, with SARS-CoV-2. When you look at the genetics and you look at the sequence of the virus, is some of that predictable ahead of time? Uh, you're on mute, I believe, Susan. Sorry. Okay, so that's a really important question. And I think the simple answer is we can't really tell at all. I mean, if you look at the genomes, like I said, the replicase genes are really similar. The spikes are similar, but they use different receptors. But no, because if you look at SARS-1 and SARS-2, they're, they're really, they have very similar genes. But again, a very small, uh, you know, one amino acid change, a very small mutation can have a huge effect on how the virus behaves. 
So I think it's going to be really difficult to figure out um, what about genetically about that virus is making it spread asymptomatically, for example. It's probably not simple. I thought it was interesting when you were talking about these these um, pan coronavirus therapeutic targets. So I, I think you're you're talking about potential therapies that could be effective against all sorts of different coronaviruses. And twice in your slide, you show these replicase proteins, these these replicase areas. Sh are, should we be focusing with the vaccines on different areas than just the spike protein? I mean, it, it, it does seem to some extent that we have all of our eggs in one basket. Well, the spike protein is clearly the most obvious protein because it, it attaches to receptor and we can target its, we can prevent it from attaching to receptor. It's also displayed on the uninfected cell. So the infected cell also presents another target for antibodies against spike. Um, the other proteins, for example, the M and E proteins also have their transmembrane, they're in the membrane, in the viral membrane and in the cell membrane, but in the viral membrane, there's just a little piece sticking out. So Potentially, um, you, you could, they might be, uh, antibodies against them might be somewhat effective, but, but really the, because of the functions of the spike, it's really the obvious one. If there's going to be one protein as opposed to, say, an attenuated vaccine or something like that. Um, Nicole, Nikki, you know, you, you um, have worked in this area for so long and you've, you probably have a bit of a crystal ball and no one has a perfect one, but trying to predict sort of how things are going to go forward. Michael Osterholm was on yesterday saying that the next 12 weeks are going to be the darkest weeks of this pandemic. It, do, you, do you agree with that? I do right now. I mean, I still think there is some time to turn this around, but um, obviously we are heading into winter. We are heading into gigantic surges in caseloads. And we know now that deaths, you know, lag that by what, three plus weeks. And I think we're just starting to see the upswing of that surge. And it's in places that we didn't necessarily expect to see it. It's in younger populations. We're seeing more and more evidence now that while well, younger populations or kids or school age kids um, might not get infected or get sick, that weeks later, you see that second generation of infections and then the third, and that gets um, sort of transmitted also up the age spectrum to parents and grandparents. So I'm very worried about this. Um, it is time, I think, as, as Dr. Fauci tells us all the time, to hunker down, put on our masks, work from home if we can, uh, show respect for other people by social distancing and putting on, um, you know, continuing to, to wear masks and do the hand washing and all that. I'm very, very struck um, when, I, when I am out. How many people now think that they can all crowd together as long as they're wearing a mask? You know, I don't think that that's very safe behavior. You see people crowded on lines to get into places and they're close together in these huddles. Maybe they're wearing masks, but they need to do all of those behaviors, all five of them, not just one. So I think we're headed for some really, really tough times. And hopefully, um, hopefully, you know, as Dr. Fauci says, and as I think too, you know, early part of next year, we'll start to see the opportunity for a vaccination campaign. And even with that, and even with the first vaccine out there, it'll be a while before we can relax on those behaviors, but at least we'll start to see some light at the end of the tunnel. D Dr. Fauci, you know, you, you, talked about these gating criteria, and we're going back to now March, April sort of time frame, and they were pretty clearly laid out. You see a 14-day downward trend in overall numbers of new inf newly infected people. You see a decrease in symptomatology. You have testing in place, all these things, and the gating criteria really weren't, weren't adopted, as we could calculate it, really anywhere. I mean, some places better than others. If we had really adopted those gating criteria, again, waiting for those 14 da downward trends before opening things up. How, how much of a difference would it have made? Because the virus is still there. We still don't have a vaccine. It's still very contagious. How much of a difference would it have made, do you think? I think it would have made a, a, significant, a significant difference, Sanjay, in that, uh, as I mentioned back when we were having those daily conferences uh, in the White House press room, that if you do that with the thought in mind that you do want to open the country and open the economy to make the safe and prudent uh, 
marching through the various phases from gateway to phase one, to phase two, to phase three, you could get much of the economy opened again without having the all or none phenomenon. I think the all or none phenomenon was the thing that did us in where individuals were so understandably uh, concerned about being shut down that when things began to open, they skipped over the benchmarks and the gateways and the different phases. And in some areas, essentially let it fly as it were. And we didn't have the situation where we could gradually reemerge into a society that is careful. And then, as I've said very often, Sanjay, and it's true that there was a perception that public health measures is the obstacle to opening the economy, as opposed to being a safe, gradual gateway and roadway to opening the economy. So we wound up getting these surges. And when you get a surge, Sanjay, you have such a level of community spread that it makes containment and control very, very difficult. Because remember, our baseline never got down below 20,000 per day. And then when we try to so-called open up without any constraints, it went up to 70,000 cases a day. And now it's back down between 55 and sometimes a, some days 70. So I think we could have done it. We, we weren't going to eliminate it, but we could have kept things under enough control to keep the economy going at a modest rate until we do get something like a vaccine that's widely distributed. You know, part of, part of the reason I ask is based on the slides that you were showing with the United States compared to the European Union. And I was talking to some of my, uh, some folks over in Europe this morning. You know, there, there is a sense of inevitability sometimes I get when I talk to them. Like, look, we did a good job for a while, but this is a bad virus. And it came back with a, with the real roar as we're seeing in the EU now, is there an inevitability about this or are there places that you point to and say, they did it right, they're basically going to be okay uh, and, and they'll you know, be in line for the vaccine? Well, you know, I, I mean, when you look throughout the country, I mean, our, our own country is very large and very heterogeneous and there are areas that have done better than others. But remember, there are mitigating circumstances. When you look at some of the foreign countries, the other countries that were islands that were able to immediately open up or shut down without necessarily crushing the economy. I mean, New Zealand, I mean, New Zealand was such an extraordinary example. I think they have 5 million people in New Zealand, if I'm not mistaken, and they have great control. And now they're doing things in a very open way without any, any harm coming to the society because they can control it much better than we can. So I don't think there's any example of anything comparable to us that has done it in a way that now all of a sudden is exempt from the difficulties that we're seeing now throughout the world. I don't think we're going to be able to get our arms around this, Sanjay, and really get everything going in approaching normal without some contribution with a vaccine. I think we've got to realize that that's going to be the way that we're going to have to go. But we can get control at the same time without shutting down. And, and, and I, I have to keep emphasizing this, Sanjay, so allow me to, is that there's a misperception that when we say public health measures, we mean shut down. And then when people are shut down, understandably, the country is fatigued with this issue of shutting down, as is the rest of the world. We're not talking about shutting down. We're talking about prudent, careful ways of reopening the economy and reopening the country. And we can do that. The mechanisms of it are very simple. I mentioned that in my talk. The issue, as Nikki mentioned, you know, universal wearing of masks, keeping a distance, avoiding congregate settings, particularly indoor congregate settings without masks. Those are the kind of things we've got to be very careful of. When you, when you think about um, masks, and I know you've been asked this a, a million times, um, the, the evidence is pretty clear uh, in terms of reducing spread of the virus from the person who's wearing the mask, protecting others, it seems. And you can even put some data around it. When we looked at some of the studies, they say maybe a six-fold decrease in transmission, right. roughly. Not perfect, but, but pretty good. I just want to be clear on the protection to the user 
of the mask. And you and I've talked about this and there is meta analysis out there sort of looking at that. But how would you just describe this? For the person who's wearing the mask, should they feel a sense of protection that they also, because of their what mask wearing, that they are protected? There should be some, but don't rely on that. And I think Nikki brought up a good point about it is also as important to avoid congregate settings as it is. I mean, you should wear a mask. I mean, you're right. Predominantly, the evidence indicates that it prevents you from infecting others. But there is almost certainly some degree of protection to oneself. It's difficult to measure that because of the confounding circumstances that continue to not make it easy to do a single trial of knowing whether it protects you, all other things being equal. It's an impossible study to do, Sanjay, but it almost makes common sense that if there are particles that are respiratory droplets that are coming out from someone else, that if you can even block it a bit, you would be protecting yourself somewhat. The degree to which you protect yourself, Sanjay, I can't give you a number on that. I think we need to be modest enough and humble enough to know that we don't know the answer to that. But it intuitively even just makes sense that if you have a barrier, you're going to interfere with some droplets coming your way. The, the real shift in thinking, again, I think, as you said, uh, as, as others have said as well, in terms of advocating for mask wearing came about when we were pretty confident that this could spread, this, this particular virus, even if somebody had no symptoms. If someone is sick, they should be at home. But if they could be out spreading, untested, asymptomatic, they could still be spreading. That's when it became clear to you that masks should be advocated widely? Yes. I mean, it'd be, well, there were several things, you know, you, you know, the way the circumstances evolved. A, there was this feeling that there would be um, a shortages for those who really need them very early on. That was the big deal. We didn't have enough PPE, including masks. Then it became clear that cloth masks worked reasonably well, and therefore there was no more shortage. Then the different analyses, meta-analyses and others came in that, in fact, it does work. But I think the real cruncher of it all was when it became clear to us, just as you alluded to a moment ago, Sanjay, that, you know, 40 to 45 percent of the people who are infected are asymptomatic. And modeling studies shows you that a substantial proportion of the infections go from someone who's not symptom uh, symptomatic is without symptoms. So that means that nobody has any idea who in society is infected or not. Therefore, everybody should be wearing a mask to protect others in case you are asymptomatically infected, and to some extent, as we said, to perhaps even protect yourself from others. It was a gradual accumulation of knowledge that made it so clear now why the recommendation for wearing masks is so strong. Uh, Nicole, I, I'm, I'm curious. I saw you nodding when Dr. Fauci was talking about uh, we don't need a, a, another shutdown or, or, or sort of trying to shut things down economically. But, I'm, but, but I am curious because, you know, the virus is, is pretty widespread in this country and it's going to be a while for a vaccine. People have described these sort of circuit breaker sort of shutdowns. And, and, I, and I'm just asking because I realize it's a provocative topic. People, nobody wants to shut things down again, but even for short periods of time to just sort of break the cycles of transmission, given how widespread this has become, and the fact that the numbers are going up, these next 12 weeks going to be the darkest. Is there any role for that, do you think, Nikki? Well, I'm not sure our society right now will tolerate it, you know, which is, is sort of a different issue. So you have to think about also, you know, what is, what is practical. And what seems to me is practical and doable is to have a much better system than we have right now in this country for community level surveillance. So that when you start to be able to predict a surge in a community, whether it's the percent positive cases or potentially other markers that people are building predictive models for, that's the time to alert that community that we really need to sort of double down on our efforts. Uh, you don't need to do that to the whole country at once as a, as a massive circuit breaker. You know, we see in this outbreak, we saw it, we see it every year in influenza, um, and we certainly saw it in H1N1, people would describe these community level outbreak locations as sort of like popcorn and a popcorn popper. And it shows up in one place and then it slows down and it shows up in another place and it slows down. And if, if you can start to predict that upswing, uh, 
and you can really engage the community in the mitigation measures then. And then maybe then, you know, there is a role for very temporarily thinking about um, cooling it on open bars or restaurants or partying and those sorts of things so that that community can reset and you can get ahead of and stop that early predicted surge from becoming a massive outbreak. That ought to be the goal. That's gonna require, by the way, uh, a lot more testing, a lot more surveillance. It's why having a strong public health system uh, remains so terribly important. And not only a lot more testing in terms of the quantity of tests, but the quality of tests and the turnaround so that in fact, you know really rapidly that you've got to take um, action to isolate yourself and protect others if it turns out that you're positive. You know, uh, Chikwe, we're so immersed in this here in the United States. I mean, I mean, all of us think about this all the time. I know you do in Nigeria as well. I, I'm just curious, when you look at the U.S. response now and you hear this discussion, uh, we haven't tested enough. There's probably five to 10 times more people out there who have been infected than we've actually accounted for. The numbers are going up and we're going into winter season. From, from your perspective in a different country doing the same sort of work, what do, you, what do you think? I mean, again, the United States CDC is sort of the, the benchmark for, for, for even for you. What do you think of the response here in the United States? Um. I think that there's so much, right now we've got to separate the wheat from the chaff a bit in terms of defining what has happened. And, and to be honest, a lot of great work has happened uh, around the world, in the US and in, in, in uh, many other countries. We are, we are struggling with the scale of testing in another, um, you know, we, we're not, we're, we haven't tested up to a million people altogether. So we've, we've got to build up uh, our own testing capacities. We started from a completely different base, obviously, in terms of our testing architecture and capacity around the country, which we have scaled dramatically, but by no means to uh, where it, it needs to be. But I think one thing that we do have in common with the US and has given me food for thought, thought is you know, the federal structure. Is how, how do federal countries that are arranged in a federal government uh, system of governance. How do you manage national emergencies and national public health emergencies? And how do you get the coalition of governance and structure in the response where needed? So we, we've had, we've struggled with this, uh, but we found a way to get most of our states aligned around a national uh, response. Not all of them, but most of them, most of the time. Uh, but it hasn't been easy, and we haven't faced this type of situation before. And I look at the U.S., I see a similar, a similar challenges, obviously, to scale. Um, a much bigger, a, a bigger country with a, a lot longer history of uh, public health. But, you know, I look at Germany and how they have managed, um, take a few lessons. Spain is also a very federal country, had very unique local characteristics of how they responded. So I, I think when we look back, there'll be a lot of lessons to learn from each other. But I, I absolutely agree with uh, Dr. Fauci when he says, you know, when this, uh, when transmission reaches a certain, I, I call it almost a tipping point, it becomes very difficult with, with all the measures that we we, um, we advocate to really bend the curve downwards. And, and then it's very frustrating for people uh, when you can't do it. And, and then you almost wish for a level of state intervention in that, that is a kind of conflict with a, 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 a liberal country in terms of where the, where did the power of the state start and end. And, and to conclude, when I, I was part of that WHO mission, and uh, that went to China very early in the, in the response, uh, in, in, fe in February or first week of March. Um, wow, you know, what I saw there, I, I immediately knew uh, it would be hard to implement in many other countries, not to talk about uh, Nigeria. Because w when people talk about a lockdown, they never speak about the other half. The fact that if you, if you lock down a country or a state, that you have to have the 
social architecture to deliver to people a means of livelihood, uh, to eat, to their medicines. Uh, uh, you, you have to support local businesses. And in a way, if a country is not able to do that, you know, you, it, it means from the beginning that lockdowns cannot be sustained. So we were very clear in the beginning in Nigeria that yes, we were acting like many other countries in a national lockdown mode, but that we were never able to go, going to be able to sustain this for prolonged periods of time. And, and so we had a very planned uh, reopening. Um, thankfully, for all sorts of reasons, we seem to have locked down at a stage or stopped international travel at a stage where the initial seeding infections in Nigeria were not as much as might have led to a, a, an explosion of cases. So, you know, we'll, we'll see how this uh, pans out in the long run, but I think there's still many, many lessons to be learned. And as long as we're in response mode, it's very difficult to have the brain space as a global scientific community to learn all the lessons. So I, I, I want us to remain, remain in Nigeria and in Africa, very humble in, our, in, in what's gone on. But I, I think in the long term, we also must look at certain things we've done well, uh, because if we hadn't done well, we would have been uh, received that. I can imagine, you can imagine the amount of criticism that would have been thrown at the African continent if things were shaped mm -hmm. Uh, in the other direction. So, um, but right now um, we've got to work as long as there's a big risk somewhere in the world, we remain at risk in Nigeria and on the continent and must keep working hard uh, to prevent an escalation of cases in our neck of the woods. Yeah, I mean, an infection anywhere is an infection everywhere, the saying goes. Um, Susan, I wanna, we're gonna take audience questions here. We've got a lot coming in, but Susan, I just wanna ask you, uh, President Trump's treatment course when, for COVID-19. He received monoclonal antibodies, uh, remdesivir, and dexamethasone along with supplemental oxygen, we know. I'm just curious, can, can you sort of piece that together when, when you think about this virus in terms of how it is best treated? Uh, how did that treatment course sound to you? Well, I'm not a, I'm not a physician, but just uh, from what we know about the virus, the remdesivir, of course, is, is directed against the replicating virus. And the monoclonal antibodies are also directed against the replicating virus by different mechanisms, one by the replication of the RNA and one by the, um, the spike protein and entry. So those are two complementary mechanisms, I think, antiviral mechanisms. The dexamethasone, of course, is, from what I understand, is directed against the latter stage of the infection, the inflammatory um, stage. Dr. Fauci can probably comment on this better than I can, but but so it seems like you're you're trying to stop the virus and the, but the um and the dexamethasone may be may be anti-inflammatory so maybe anti-antivirus so they may be uh, opposed to each other as well so um it seemed to me like they were just uh, throwing everything they could at the at the virus um so. well, and that very well could be the case i mean uh, you know um president, you know, they maybe want to try all sorts of different things. But Dr. Fauci, giving a steroid uh, at the same time you're giving an antiviral medication, um, are, are those counter forces then? I mean, you suppress the immune system a bit, you're decreasing inflammation with the steroid. How, how do you think through that clinically for people who are taking care of patients like that? Well, I think, you know, it was, um, there's an overlap there. Sanjay, I mean, strictly speaking, if you want to be puristic about it, if you're going to hit the virus, you hit the virus, you want the immune system to be intact, and you want a degree of inflammation that sort of supplements the immune response. Whereas with the dexamethasone, it was predominantly shown by the UK study to be for people with a very advanced disease on ventilators and requiring oxygen. I think what triggered the, um, the dexamethasone initiation Again, I'm looking at it from a distance, but just looking at what's known about it was the fact that there was a drop in his uh, oxygen saturation for a while. So they felt the better part of valor would be to give him the dexamethasone. That's the reason why they did it. Uh, Susan, the, the, you talked about the fatality rate for SARS being around 10% mortality rate. For flu, it's seasonal flu is, is often cited as around 0.1%. We understand there are people who are more at risk, obviously, uh, vulnerable individuals, but across the board, do we know 
what the fatality rate is for SARS-CoV-2 now? I mean, if you do the math here in the United States, it would suggest it's around 0.27 or 0.3 even, you know, if you just do the math. But there's obviously a lot more people out there who have been infected and not counted, raising the denominator. What, what can we say right now? How, how lethal is this? I, I, I think we don't know. Um, I think the epidemiologists will know better, better than I, but I think the fact that there are so many un, maybe unreported infections is going to make it much lower. But for people that are older and vulnerable, it's still pretty, uh, pretty intimidating, <laughs> pretty bad. No, no, no question. And, and just we got questions coming in. But Dr. Fauci, one thing we talked about a, a few months ago, again, we know who the vulnerable individuals are, but there was a 34 year old nurse in our hospital not that long ago who got critically ill, uh, no pre existing conditions at all, um, really, and not, not a, no medications, no medical history, and became really ill with this. Is it, is it still, are we any better predicting? People like that who are likely to get very ill, because I think there's often the sense that I'm young, I'm healthy, I'm pretty vulnerable, and the, the numbers are obviously very much in their favor. But what do we know about why some people like that get so sick? You know, we don't we don't know the answer to that, Sanjay, and that's something that we need to obviously figure out. Is it the distribution of ACE2 receptors in their upper airway versus their lower airway? Are there any genetic polymorphisms there? that we don't know about regarding interferon, which is an important component of the blocking of the virus. I still think there's so much unknown that we really can't say. However, one of the things that you pointed out, I think people should realize that the more, even though statistics, no doubt, if you look at the deaths overwhelmingly in the elderly and those with underlying conditions, but what we're seeing more of now as we get unfortunately more clinical experience with this, is that there are studies coming out now of large numbers of individuals in their 30s and their 40s who winding up requiring hospitalization and intensive care. Maybe that is masked and not appreciated underlying comorbidities. There are more comorbidities in society than we really appreciate. If you look at the obesities and the diabetes and the hypertension and things like that, I think we better be careful as we learn more and more that we don't make any definitive conclusions about the scope of the involvement of serious illness. We're still learning a lot more about that. Yeah, and, and I'm not gonna spend really any time today talking about herd immunity. You mentioned it briefly in your comments, Dr. Fauci, but uh, yeah. safe to say there's close to 100 million people roughly, if you start to look at age and pre-existing conditions that would be considered vulnerable. Uh, the idea of bubbling them off from the rest of the society, you know, I, I think people fundamentally understand, not to mention the toll that that sort of strategy would take. Um, we got we got lots of questions coming in. So let me get to this one. And I'm going to give this to you, Nikki. Um, this is from Elaine Jaffe. Question is, can you comment on ongoing research and strategic initiatives to prevent the emergence of new coronaviruses in the future? And I think what's driving this question is one of our NAM members, Dr. Peter Daschek, has been pursuing the line of study for some time, but his funding was recently rescinded. Um, what strategies do you think of when we think of the future? And I don't know if you know Peter's story and Eco Alliance, but uh, just any thoughts on that? Sure, and I think it's a great question. And you know, if I think about well, what is preparedness research really about? Some of it is is very much about trying to predict. Uh, what pathogens are going to arise, whether they're coronaviruses or other things. And in the case of, of Peter Daszak's work, he's identified something like 780 strains of coronavirus that come from bats, a huge number, right? And so the question and the kinds of questions are then, which ones are, are more likely to emerge and cause trouble? I think Susan showed, showed us they're from two really different lineages, and we might want to pay attention to both of those. But then to think about, well, if, if that's the case, what do we think about the bat reservoirs and their contact with humans? And is that growing or shrinking? And I think probably we'll hear on the climate change session, as we think about um, many parts of the world where humans are in more and more contact with the animal reservoir as we bring these mega cities out into previously forested areas that the opportunities for spillover events um, might get to be greater. So what are those spillover events? How do we think about predicting them? How do we think about preventing them? 
How do we understand the intermediate host? And then moving forward from that. So I think Peter's work and other work like that is, is terribly, terribly important in this, in this one health approach. And then going from there to the kind of work that's going on at NIAD with saying, okay, there are these prototype pathogens. How do we start thinking about vaccine platforms or, or antivirals to deal with these prototype pathogens and what can we do on the preventive end? Um, I was you know, really distressed to hear the story about his funding being um, terminated. Um, and, and I think that there have been a series of um, things since then. And I believe that his work is ongoing. Somebody else can correct me about the details of that, but it's a good example for me of when I talk about, I'm afraid now we're gonna have to have some sort of an agenda about scientific integrity and how we protect science from political interference and how we protect science from mistrust. It's clear that the system that we've had in place up to now has not been sufficient to protect that system and the system of science um, through this pandemic. I will say that um, in every emergency that I've been involved with and, and other epidemics and pandemics, there's always sort of a bit of a political element to how it's handled, but I've not seen anything where the politics is really um, aimed at the science or the scientists themselves. And, you know, I think we owe particular, you know, scientists around the world, but since we're here in the US, most of us now, um, especially our career scientists in government, an incredible debt of gratitude for the work that they do uh, on behalf of the country, both scientifically and the work that they continue to do to protect the scientific integrity um, of the decision-making uh, for the country. Well, I, I, I appreciate you saying that. And I think the last eight, nine months have made me super cynical, I guess, in some ways, but I, I really, I mean, I feel like there has been political interference on, uh, on the science. I mean, I think you can point to numerous instances of, of that, and I'm not going to, to drag Dr. Fauci into that because it's a scientific discussion. But this, I mean, some of the, the maligning, the name calling, the undermining of, of basic science, I think, has been a, a gigantic problem. Nikki. Oh, I, no, totally agree. And what I'm saying is I've always seen, you know, a little bit of stuff on response. I've never seen scientists maligned. I've never seen the scientific process maligned like it has now. And I think one of, as we think about the lessons learned from this and always wanting to do better the next time, what's clear to me is that the system that we counted on up to now was insufficient to withstand that attack. And I think we're going to have to do some serious thinking and some figure, figure out how it is um, that we build a system that better protects science, which is what's going to get us out of this box in large part. Uh, going forward. Dr. Fauci, this is a novel virus. I mean, and, and that means something. It's it's new. Uh, we, we didn't know how this was going to behave. So at a time when you're dealing in the beginning with limited information, emerging information, trying to make important decisions in that context, I mean, you know, it's, it's not math. Two plus two doesn't equal four. We don't know exactly what the answers are here. How did you approach that type of decision-making? If you're going to err because you're not going to get it perfect, I think, as Nikki is saying, in terms of the response, you're going to err one side or the other. How do you, how do, how do you, just going into your mind for a second, how did you approach that sort of thinking? Well, I think the way you approach it, Sanjay, is to admit to yourself and to others, sometimes they don't hear it quite right, that we don't know all the answers right away. And you've got to, if you have to make a scientific or a policy decision, you have to make it on the best information you have at that time knowing full well that you have to keep an open mind as to the evolving information as it occurs and then be able to change a policy or a recommendation based on the data that you have. One of the things that has been so frustrating, and I think this is understandable, so I don't mean it in a pejorative way to anyone or any segment of society, when they see these kinds of changes they think they're mistakes. No, they're not a mistake. <laughs> a mistake is when you have an information and you judge wrongly. 
when you're evolving and a situation like the evolving of this extraordinary pandemic occurs and you keep an open mind of learning things more and more and more, you tend to change and keep an open mind depending on the best available data. And we've got to get society to understand that, that that's the scientific process. It's self-evolving and it's self-correcting. I mean, it, when we first, I mean, if you look at the events as they've occurred, Sanjay, in the beginning, it was felt that this was just a jumping from an animal to a human with very little transmission from human to human. Then we heard, well, it transmits from human to human, but not very efficiently. And then we heard, wow, it's even more efficient than we thought. And then there's no community spread, but oops, there's a lot of community spread. And then not only is there community spread, but it's been individuals who don't even have any symptoms. On day one, when we saw this new virus come out, we didn't know any of that. So it depends. You got to make sure you don't overshoot in a way and you don't undershoot in a way. You've just got to keep your mind open and know that you've got to make your decision based on the best available scientific evidence and data. I, I, uh, I, I know that we are getting close to, to um, our, our end time here, although we, we're going a little bit over, I'm told, uh, uh, which I hope is okay. Just one, one more question for you, Dr. Fauci. I think you, I know you have to run, but the vaccine again, there's going to be different versions of the vaccine. Uh, you're going to Kind of like the, I don't know, an iPhone. You got the iPhone 10, iPhone 11. That's the way somebody framed that question to me recently. But should everyone go out and get the first iPhone if they can, if they qualify, or should, or, or would people be reasonable to say, hey, look, uh, I'm going to wait for version two to come out, which is likely to be uh, more effective or safer, or whatever. Yeah, that's a great question, Sanjay. And I think that is going to depend on a number of factors. First is how effective the vaccine is shown to be. And is it shown to be effective uniformly among different demographic groups, young versus old, people with underlying conditions? If you have an underlying condition and you find that you are in a high risk situation and you have a vaccine that's of reasonable efficacy, I would go ahead and take that vaccine if you're, if you're really at a higher risk. If you're an otherwise very healthy young person, you might want to wait and see what the next iteration would be. But you really... And, and I believe, and in fact, I'm certain this is going to happen, when the ultimate recommendations come out, which generally come out through the CDC via the uh, Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, that you'll see a hierarchy of recommendations of who should get the vaccine. And I think you have to factor into that how effective it is and what risk category you as an individual are in. Uh, uh, Jikwe, I want to ask you this question that's just coming in specifically for you. Uh, Nigeria had successful contact tracing, which helped and continue to help in the control of Ebola. And the, uh, is the lack of legitimate across the board privacy rules, state health systems, uh, the culture, is that a result of their not being very effective or help, helpful within the context of this current pandemic? Um, do we need to be more like Nigeria in that respect? I guess they're asking about the United States. Uh, are there lessons learned from the contact tracing efforts in Nigeria uh, around Ebola? I think there are a lot of lessons to be learned, but we also have to be humble and say that contact tracing is very difficult in the context of COVID, right? Uh, because of what we've been talking about, the, the, the number of asymptomatic patients and uh, infections. And so it's very, it's much more difficult to, to define where you've gotten the infection or where you've spread it to, but we still have to do it the best way we possibly can. And yes, we have a, a, a huge public health workforce that is used to doing this over and over again, but I, I must be honest, it has challenged us with uh, COVID-19 um, significantly, but um, you know, uh, we, we can't stop doing it. And uh, right now, um, you know, if you can't trace individual contacts, it's important to look at clusters in whatever setting. We're just about uh, reopening schools. Uh, so uh, we're training everyone to pay a spe special attention to school settings to be able to define, detect transmission and therefore uh, define the contact tracing in new ways, and, and but but this is an area that has been neglected for for many years in public health. 
you know, contact tracing is almost, people think about it as what anyone can do. And, and some people at the bottom of the public health food chain, um, you know, you give them a piece of paper or a tablet or whatever, and they go out there and, and ask for contacts. We've now all come to the realization that we've got to think a little bit more uh, deeply and in detail about uh, contact tracing. It's apparently not as easy as we all thought it was. There was a recent WHO consultation on contact tracing, and it was amazing how um, views have changed about this. So I, I think there is a lot we can learn from each other. And if, if I have one final word on this, I, I think that's a big lesson for the global health community that this must bring us closer together. You know, we, there's, we keep talking about global health and global health security, but you know, no one really defines what global means. You know, what are the real mechanisms through which we want to work together? And how much do we really focus on making those mechanisms easy and accessible for us to work with, our, with each other and cross those national boundaries that we've set for ourselves. And, and really with viruses, you know, they don't make any sense, but they would fall apart just because we want them to fall apart. We need those mechanisms. We need a strong WHO. We need Africa Center for Disease Control. We need collaboration between countries because there's just no other way this time. Uh, to, we can't build an army around our borders. So no matter what we have or where we think or how we think about ourselves or the other, I think out of this outbreak, uh, we must redefine how we choose to work with each other for our own best interest, not as an altruistic piece of action for the poor guys down south, but right. really for our own enlightened self-interest. We we just have a couple of minutes left, so and I know that's a it's a, um, a a big question to ask about the future in terms of lessons learned, but but Dr. Fauci, I, I you've you know you've been doing this for so long and you've seen so many different outbreaks and as you have said many times you've learned something each time. Is there a particular lesson from this this pandemic that you think will be important for future pandemics, future outbreaks? You know, I think there are a few uh, lessons, uh, Sanjay. I think one is what's what has happened uh, in the United States when you think of local public health systems that we've let uh, essentially a trit and 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 almost uh, diminish in 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 quantity and quality. We've really got to rebuild that up in the United States, but also we've got to develop really strongly this global health security network that we started on some time ago to have transparency and interaction and communication uh, throughout. Uh, you know, we use the word, what does global mean? Well, you know, global means that everybody's on the same page here, uh, knowing that this will happen again. Uh, one of the other things I think we do from a scientific standpoint and not necessarily a public health standpoint is that Nikki throw, showed on one of her slides something that we've been working on uh, very intensively here at NIAID is the prototype pathogen approach to essentially utilize uh, information of big on large families of pathogens so you don't have to start from square one. I mean, right now, uh, I think it's time for us to realize that we are being threatened by coronaviruses. <laughs> We've now had three pandemics, so the time has come. And I really like Susan's slide where she showed my eyes lit up when I saw all of the potential vulnerable targets for an antiviral drugs that we should start making right now, just the same way as we did with antivirals for HIV. There were multiple vulnerable targets on that replication cycle. So the lesson we've learned right now is take the prototype pathogen approach and look at what you can do for vaccine platforms and for therapeutics. And one of the things we need to do right now is get that moving because this will happen again. That's great. And, and, uh, and I uh, want to ask all of you that question, but Susan, I'll go to you next because just bouncing right out of that. I mean, I, I also love that slide and it, I found it hopeful um, because this will happen again, replicase area versus just the spike protein. But, but I don't want to put words in your mouth. Lesson wanna... learned for the next pandemic. I want to pitch, go even a little bit back further to even more basic science than drug development, that um, the coronaviruses were always viewed as, uh, they've been called a backwater of virology. And really, 
not paid a lot of attention to for many, many years back into the 70s and 80s when when Kay Holmes first showed that, that spike protein had to be cleaved in order to be, be activated, which is now everybody knows about the furin site, et cetera, et cetera. So I just want to put in a pledge for really supporting not only coronaviruses, but all kinds of basic science that is really the root of, of developing any of these antivirals or vaccines. So I think we have to keep keep learning about these viruses. Also, just one other thing about Peter Daszak's work. So by looking at these bat viruses more carefully, we know that some of them look like they may have receptor binding domains that, that could actually infect humans right away. So some of them may be able to even skip the adaptation in the intermediate species. So it's just another, another um, plea for, for keeping that kind of research going to really know what viruses are out there and how they pose dangers to us. So that's my my uh, plea for basic science. I'm glad we, we got that in there. I mean, the National Academy really wanted to to, to learn this. Uh, and Nikki, I'll end with you. Um, and and same question, but let me just also preface this. This an interesting question came in from the graduate students, graduate class at Texas A and M. They're studying health risk assessment, and uh, one of the things they say are they're raising this concern that so much of our public health funds have been going towards this particular pandemic, COVID-2. And how worrisome is that in terms of, you know, not, not funding other public health issues enough and getting behind in other areas? Well, I think it's, it's a terrific question. And, you know, the first thing I'll, I'll just comment on, you know, sort of some of the important lessons learned and how we do things different for in the future, in the future. Um, so many aspects of being prepared for something like this are things that, that we really could do in advance and, and do scientifically. And I think there are now um, pretty um, manageable sized lists of actions to take um, to be scientifically ready uh, for the next pandemic or for the next crisis like this. I would say to the students, I, I don't disagree with this at all. And in fact, I've been having an active conversation with some colleagues about an outbreak on a couple of the Indian reservations where the proposal is now just to take all the outpatient docs, stop doing outpatient care and pivot to inpatient care because the need is so great. But in fact, we don't want to do that because so many people um, have so many chronic issues that need to be dealt with. So on a clinical level, it's a bit the same question. And so what I would say is even though we're in the middle of this pandemic, this is the time for us to be thinking really hard and designing the system that we wanna need for the future. And that system of the future has to both strengthen and reinvent the way we do public health in some new ways. It's not gonna be sufficient to build back to what we had because what we had was continually subject um, to um, being degraded by budget cuts and because stuff didn't happen. We're also in whole new areas of capabilities with health IT, with abilities to do surveillance, with understanding chronic disease, et cetera. And so I think both as a country and as a world, um, it's not too early to start thinking about how to design. And I'm gonna put a big emphasis on fund the system we want for the future. If we're losing 300 and something, $65 billion a month in global GDP, it certainly seems prudent to take out an insurance policy so we're not passing the tin cup next time. And a reinvented public health system is a big part of that insurance policy. Well, I think it's been a, a constant theme today. And I want to thank you, Nikki, for being here and Chikwe and Susan. And, uh, and Dr. Fauci, uh, as I always do, just thank you for, for everything. Thank you for your service. By the way, I enjoyed your 60 Minutes interview last night. I fully expected you to be wearing the, the black turtleneck today for the, uh, for the <laughs> session. That was a good look. Uh, but seriously, sir, thank you. Uh, and, and to Christine and to your three daughters, because I, uh, if anybody watched the interview, you know this is not, you've been working very hard, but it's been your whole family that's been involved with this in many ways. So. Thank you all, phenomenal session. Really, really appreciate the time. I learned a lot as always. Dr. Balser, over to you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Gupta. I know we've all really appreciated hearing such a compelling discussion, um, not just about the factors 
around where we are today, but what might make a difference in the future for this pandemic and the ones to follow. Um, please join me in thanking Dr. Gupta and our panelists for their contributions. Now, uh, now we, um, we're gonna have a break. It's gonna be a very brief break because we're coming back at two o'clock Eastern uh, for the next uh, session, which is going to be on climate change and human health. So please uh, take a brief pause and then rejoin us. Thank you. <laughs>